Welcome. Thank you everyone for taking time out of your day to be in the know. I am Alexis Petrick-Lack, part of the publisher support team at Overdrive, where we believe in a world enlightened by reading. We are excited to be continuing our In the Know content series with Sourcebook, a publisher who believes that books change lives with a focus on their upcoming nonfiction releases. Since we're focusing on nonfiction today, here's a fun fact. Sourcebook was our very first partner for the In the Know webinar series, so thanks for coming back. I'm especially looking forward to learning more from our authors today, so thank you for sharing your time with us. For those who are looking to explore further, links to the Overdrive Marketplace and Edelweiss will be posted in the chat. Sourcebooks also has a large collection of titles included in our nonfiction sale in the Overdrive Marketplace, so we'll be posting a link there. Now over to Margaret to introduce herself, today's presentation, and the first set of titles. Thank you so much, Alexis, and good afternoon from sunny Chicago, and hello over at Drive and librarian friends. I'm Margaret Coffey from Sourcebooks. Thanks for joining us today and for the continued support of our books. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to present new nonfiction titles from board books all the way up to adult. We have books for all ages, as you can obviously tell. You'll be hearing from seven of our amazing authors today who are calling in from literally all over the globe. Thanks, Alexis. Thanks, the Overdrive team. Um, you're a wonderful partner, and we are enjoying our third in the know. Just a few housekeeping notes. Please visit our website for discussion guides and newsletter sign up. Visit Edelweiss and NetGalley for eGalleys. If you're a public librarian, vote for Library Reads. Your votes are invaluable. And if you're interested in author visits, please let Ashlyn know her information is on this slide. So let's get started with my favorite upcoming picture book, which will be available on August 9th from Sourcebooks Explore, our kids nonfiction imprint. I've had the pleasure of working with Ali and George at TLA and ALA this year, and they are a tremendous team. For instance, college, they collaborated on their debut, Black Boy, Black Boy. Ali Kamanda is an award-winning filmmaker and social entrepreneur from Sierra Leone, which is where he is right now. He runs Bico Studios, a cross-cultural film production company, and is the president of Salon Rising, a not-for-profit organization that provides microfinancing and mentoring resources to small business owners in rural Sierra Leone. George Redman currently works in the Buncombe County District Attorney's Office as an assistant district attorney, as an adjunct professor in South College's legal department. Over to you, George and Ali. What's up, everybody? Ali, you're on mute. <laughs> there, that's even better. <laughs> All right, let's start that one over again, brother. You ready? Let's go. <laughs> All right. What's up, everybody? All right. I get myself on mute. <laughs> hey, my name is Ali Kamanda. My name is George Redman. And we are the co-authors of Black Boy, Black Boy. Uh, George, why don't you go ahead and just lead us off? Yes. So initially, uh, Black Boy, Black Boy came about during, I call it, um, Ali and my, our COVID baby, right? This is something where it came out. This actually came through the, um, the murder of George Floyd and what we inspired from that um, came this creation of this book. And initially it came about as, what is it that black boys see in this world as inspiration as hope? Immediately when I saw George Floyd, my thoughts went back to Rodney King and it went back to um, essentially, where's our inspiration and what are kids looking at? Because this was a viral image that um, not only Ali and my, our kids were seeing, but but uh, people everywhere. And so what we wanted to do was essentially um, draw this inspiration and, and move it into a sense where we could create something with it. Um, so initially it kind of came about as at a favorite child children's book called Black, uh, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What You See. Um, and so initially um, what I had before I went to law school, I used to teach. And when I used to teach, I asked kids, what is it that they wanted to be? Um, the things that they wanted to be was a baller or a rapper. And in my mind, I was like, what happened to everything else? What happened to being a pilot, an engineer, a doctor, an astronaut, a physicist, a judge, anything else besides these two tracks? And so immediately the thought was, well, perhaps they don't know about their historical figures 
that are providing this sort of inspiration that could help them change from that two-tier track. And so I started coming uh, with this sort of simple coach be not to brown bear, brown bear, um, and it got very dark. Um, it got really dark. It was like brown, uh, black boy, black boy, what do you see? I see police brutality, or I see uh, institutional slavery or racial inequality. Um, and so luckily, uh, after coming up with these ideas, Ali was able to rein it all in for us. And he basically was like, what are we trying to do here? Um, we have two boys that are weeks apart and that are about to be 10 years old. Um, and so what we wanted to do with this book is provide an inspiration to them. And so what we wanted to do is incorporate historical figures that aren't usually taught. Um, and, and so the hope would be is that if they learned about their past, that it would help shape their future. And I love that uh, when we do this, George gets to express that because when, when he says it, it got dark when we were trying to create this, it, it, was, it really was one of those to where, honestly, George just started to write himself as a little horror story, you know? <laughs> so we're like, we're trying to write a children's book here, buddy. Um, we want to actually do something that's a little more hopeful and inspirational. And for us, I think one of the key things that um, we had to focus on was about being intentional. And so what we started with was with representation. Um, because for us, um, we all recognize the, the importance that representation brings because it does matter, especially in works that are for kids. You know, um, I like to say that there's something very powerful, um, something very inspirational, something aspirational for a kid to see their likeness in a book. Um, when George and I were growing up, the reality was that for us, we did not have literature that um, reflected our lives, you know, that celebrated our existence. And so once we found ourselves here as fathers, um, it was something that we had to really grasp and embrace um, because it was a blessing to be fathers of two amazing boys. So we wanted to be intentional about creating something for them. Um, and that also would translate ultimately to black boys everywhere, you know, that would inspire them to have a sense of identity, you know, um, an identity that they would be proud of and grow up with in confidence, knowing that their life matters. And um, on that same note, to never have to feel like they were less than anyone ever. So um, with that, this is how this was spawned. And what it turned into for us then was this fun introduction for us um, into Black history. You know, the truth is that there's so much we don't know about Black history, myself included. Um, and as Georgia had just mentioned, when we get into Black History Month, we are almost always talking about, let's say, three particular people. And every time that we get to do uh, presentations, especially in person, I've loved for us to present the opportunity and say, here's, let's do a test. If everybody in this room, and there could be about 50 of us or so, if we're all sitting in here um, and we were to say, hey, let's talk about black history. I, our guarantee was that just about almost 100% of us would reflect on the same three figures, you know? So this was that opportunity for us to expand that lexicon, you know? Um, and what we were able to do was find particular names that spoke to us but that also we thought um, challenged the, the hierarchy um, in, in terms of what we would say defines um, masculinity. And so we, we had a few people that we knew were not necessarily what a lot of kids studied or were aware of. And we thought that would be a way to bring them into the conversation. Um, I like to end it with saying that we, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, you know, So for black boys everywhere, this was, that chance for us to let them know that they too stand on the shoulders of giants and what we wanted to do was then be aware of these folks who have lived incredible lives and done amazing things and our hope was to inspire them to be proud of their past at the same time um, embrace what we would say would be their limitless future so we are super excited about this you know um, we are debut authors you got to hold it up man you got to market it use your marketing days there you go flashing around a little bit, there you go. Look at that cute boy on that cover. He's just screaming at you. Um, but it's, we are so blessed. We are super thankful and just grateful to Sorks Books for uh, seeing us, for seeing our words, and also for really putting the effort into trying to get this into the hands of kids. And that's where, you know, you guys come in. 
because what we like to say is that those of you on this call who are listening, you, you are the gatekeepers to the literature for so many of us in society. Um, and we truly believe that. And I think this process has really expanded that upon us and for us to even embrace that more, to appreciate it. Um, what you are intentional about selecting the titles that you put up and that you make available to people, and for us in particular to kids, then does have that opportunity to find an audience. So we are super grateful for this opportunity and we hope that it's a book that speaks to you and we would love it if you would definitely get it onto your shelves, into your stores and out there and we want kids to read it and we cannot wait to see what this does. So for our sons, uh, George and I, what we are, we are now like rock stars, right? Cause we created something that they like, yo, this is gonna be out. Mm -hmm. But for young kids, we hope it inspires them to believe in their capacity to do great things. And we are looking forward to the journey. So we thank you so much for the time. George, you have the last word, brother. I just want to let everyone know that uh, although the title is Black Boy, Black Boy, right? This was uh, Ali's and our dream for our boys specifically. So it was written to black boys, but it's written for all kids, yes. right? And, and sort of a thought about this is that it's kind of like a hidden figures type of moment, but for black historical figures. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we had a different array and not just athletes and entertainers, but um, individuals that come across um, and have multi-dimensional levels to them as individuals that we could uh, show, showcase in this book. And so that's the hope. We wanted to put it at a, a level where if kids started reading it, they felt it, it was easy enough for them to feel comfortable with reading because we know with reading, if they're confident, they'll continue to read. Right. And so that's the hope with this is that they enjoy the reading. They enjoy the beautiful pictures. Thank you, Ken Daly. You did a wonderful oh, pictures. Amazing. I couldn't preach. imagine the color palette that he used, but he has blown uh, everything up to a point where it's unimaginable as to what he's put together. Again, thank you all source books. Uh, thank you, my brother Ali. Thank you all for, for allowing us to be able to speak about Black Boy, Black Boy today. Ooh, hey, I did say you get the last word, but I'm gonna take you off that. Ha, sorry, brother. But the fact that it does say black boy, black boy on it is, as you were alluding to, doesn't mean it's just for black kids. Because the truth is, is that we do want kids of all races to see themselves in the story um, between, because it's, it's a love story between a black father and a son. And our hope is that in doing so, it's sort of like a window or a mirror or a door that can allow them to acknowledge the humanity and blackness. So we do think that it actually can speak to everybody. Um, so, you know, we wrote it for our sons and for black boys, but in truth, ultimately is for every young reader that's available who wants to actually learn about black history. So sorry, George, I took your last word, but that's it. That's all we got. <laughs> it's my habit. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. You are indeed rock stars. And I need to tell a very funny quick story. Um, so we were at ALA. Um, I was there with my colleague, Valerie Pierce. She and I have done hundreds of shows and we're in a Starbucks and she grabs my arm and she goes, <gasps> Jason Reynolds. And I'm like, you've seen Jason Reynolds before. What is the big deal? She's like, look at what he's holding. Look at what he's holding. And um, George and Ali had met him at the Coretta Scott King breakfast that morning. Um, he had graciously accepted a copy of the book. And yes. um, that was just a lot of fun um, to see him walking around with um, one of our titles that was coming in the fall. So again, thank you to both of you for joining us. And now I'm going to move on so, with some title presentation. Sourcebooks acquired indie publisher Duo Press on May 1st. Founded 15 years ago, Duo Press is known for its board books, regional board books, counting and doodle books. You may know the Tummy Time or Babies Around the World series. And Sourcebooks is delighted to have 120 new Duo Press titles on our list. I'd like to tell you a little bit about three new nonfiction Duo Press books on the fall list. The first is my first book of house pets. And I have to say that I'm just a little bit amazed that none of my feline or canine menagerie has managed to make an appearance yet, but the day is young. My first book of house pets is a beautiful introduction to the world of furry, fluffy, and all around adorable pets for babies and toddlers. Like other titles in the Earth-Friendly series, Terra Babies at Home, this book helps tots develop a connection with the natural world and is made with F. SC materials and non-toxic inks. Simple and quirky text pairs with charming art by Aza Gilland and animal lovers will learn about house pets in a friendly and accessible way while being introduced to basic concepts of animal care and the environment. The book even shows readers how to pick a pet from a local shelter and the importance of keeping a pet healthy and giving it tons of love. 
And next title is the Young Activist Dictionary of Social Justice. A is for ally, advocate, anti-racist, ancestors, and assembly. Using simple explanations and appealing illustrations in a familiar A to Z format, the Young Activist Dictionary of Social Justice will teach kids the new vocabulary of change. Vetted by an anti-bias, anti-racism educator, this essential new resource is packed with easily understandable definitions of timely concepts. Each beautifully designed spread represents a letter and provides concise age-appropriate definitions for 10 or more terms. With subject matter spanning issues like racial justice, climate change, gender equality, LGBTQ plus rights, income disparity, voter engagement, and immigration. Bite-sized bios accompany key terms, illuminating the stories of justice advocates, such as Greta Thunberg, Malala, Ruby Bridges, and John Lewis, who were involved with a cause at a young age. The Ultimate Dictionary of All Things Digital is our next title. Computer science is an essential part of today's curriculum, starting in elementary school. Learning the basics of computing and coding boosts kids' problem solving, creativity, and critical thinking skills while teaching them a subject that has real life applications. The Ultimate Dictionary of All Things Digital combines definitions for the basics of computing and coding, as well as the big picture issues, more complex terms that deal with safety, privacy, and abstract terminologies that I myself need to learn, like algorithm bias, NFTs, the uncanny valley. I have no idea what that is and deep fakes. Plus, a tech timeline delves into the breakthrough moments and important inventors like Ava Lovelace, Grace Hopper, and Alan Turing in the history of computer science. Our next speaker is Stephanie Cohen, a licensed and certified speech language pathologist, lactation counselor, and mother who has been working with infants and toddlers for more than 20 years. Her mission is to empower each parent to be his or her child's best teacher by supporting emotional connection and early language learning. Stephanie is also a mentor, speaker, and consultant who supports students and clinicians in the field. She hosts workshops, presents to international audiences, and has been an invited speaker at Northwestern University and for the Illinois Early Intervention Training Program. Stephanie, please tell us about please tell us about the My First Learn to Talk board books. Hi, thank you so much. I first want to start off just by saying I am so excited to be here. I'm honored to have been asked to share my new books with you. I'm honored to be um, representing source books and part of this and alongside all of you wonderful authors. And I cannot wait to add Black Boy, Black Boy to my library. That was just, I love your energy. I love it. So um, as Margaret said, I am a pediatric speech language pathologist, and some of you may even have seen us working in your libraries. I work primarily in the early intervention program in Illinois. And what that means is I support communication development for infants and toddlers. And I don't just teach the infants and toddlers how to talk, but our goal in early intervention is to facilitate stronger relationships between caregivers and children so that the caregivers are really the primary interventionists, the ones that are supporting their child's communication. And so I use lots of different materials in my work. I bring books in all the time. I work with the books that are in families' homes. And what I noticed over my years of working with children and families is that there was a gap in the market. There was a gap in the board book market. I was looking for a book that would help parents teach their children some of the building blocks of communication. And so lots of parents were motivated to help their kids use words, but through my work with them, we were able to understand that there's a lot that comes before using words. Infants learn facial expressions, they learn emotion, they learn how to make their mouths work to make simple sounds. They learn how to imitate all of these things as they're modeled by the people around them. And then finally, they begin to imitate and use words. So the gap was that step before words um, were, you know, there, there weren't any simple books that had those like small pieces, chunks of language. So I wrote it. It was also a COVID baby. Um, so <laughs> I resonate or I, I identify with, with you when you say that. Um, so what I want to do is kind of explain to you how all these building blocks are incorporated in my first Learn to Talk book. And I'm gonna show you a couple of pages so you can see what I mean as I talk. 
So on each page, I've included a simple photograph and thanks to the Sourcebook's amazing art department for helping me find just the perfect pictures for each page. But what I've done is included a simple photograph of an infant or toddler, because we know that from early infancy, as visual skills develop, infants are interested in looking at faces. It's one of the first things that they study and engage with. So I wanted to capture the attention of our youngest readers. So each page, as I said, has the simple photograph. Each child is wearing a different facial expression <clears throat> that matches the emotion that I'm communicating on each page. That facial expression and emotion is paired with an exclamatory word. So you may not have heard the term exclamatory word before, but you know what these are. These are things like, ow, uh-oh, oops, <laughs> wow. And so what I've done is I've included these words in this book because oftentimes they're easier to say than words. Also, on many of the pages, you'll notice gestures. So what I've done in this book is paired the faces, the facial expressions, the gestures, the word or the sound, and then text, rhythmic text that parents can read to their kids. So in early intervention, as I said, my goal is to strengthen relationships, right? My goal is to help parents feel successful reading books with their children, because we know if parents feel successful reading books, they'll do it more often, right? And kids will learn more and more quickly. So in the back of the book, we've included a guide that helps parents understand in the simplest ways the way to read this book, the different ways to use this book. And so I've encouraged parents and caregivers to be silly as they read this book, because we know as children are developing their social emotional skills, that they're most interested when we are engaging on an emotional level, right? And I tell parents, if you're not feeling like a little bit of a clown, you're not doing it right. <laughs> You've got to feel silly. That's what your children love. That's going to draw them into a communicative interaction. Um, so I want to show you how the book can be used. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to show you how parents might use it. So when I eat an apple, my mouth says, mmm. When my mind is thinking, my mouth says, hmm. When I'm getting mad, my mouth says, ah. When I'm really sad, my mouth says, wah. When I feel surprised, my mouth says, wow. When I fall down, my mouth says, ow. When I'm getting wild, my mouth says, roar. And when I'm super hungry, my mouth says, more. When I take a sip, my mouth says, ah. When I'm acting silly, my mouth says, ha. When the baby's sleeping, my mouth says, shh. When I'm super sleepy, my mouth says, <laughs> When I go down a slide, my mouth says, wee. When I want to have a turn, my mouth says, me. Just a few more pages. When I'm feeling playful, my mouth says, boo. When I hug my family, I say, I love you. So you probably notice there's a lot of rhythm and repetition in this book, and that's intentional. The other thing that helps kids learn to talk is by hearing verbal routines or the same phrases over and over again. So I've built that into this book. So as kids hear the book over and over again, they come to expect the big payoff at the end of each page delivered by their parent or caregiver, right? So I promised I would show you the different ways to use this book. So starting in early infancy, I help parents understand that they can simply hold up the book and as their infant's visual skills start to mature, they'll be interested in looking at faces, but I want the parent's face right there to make the connection, right? Then parents can start to imitate, imitate those facial expressions and even start to model just the word. Lots of older infants and toddlers aren't ready to sit and listen to the whole book. So my hope is that parents know that they have flexibility with this book. And then infants and toddlers or older toddlers really that are ready to listen to all the text can sit and listen to the whole book. And then here's where the magic happens. I help parents understand to use the power of the pause to help their child start to fill in the blank. So here's what that looks like. When I eat an apple, my mouth says, and they wait. And hopefully their child responds in the way that they're able to in the moment. But over time, my hope is that their child starts to fill in some of the sounds and the words that they've heard so many times. And I have to tell you, 
Um, the response so far has been pretty incredible and I couldn't be more grateful. I am receiving videos of parents reading this book with their infants and toddlers and I see how they respond at all of those different developmental levels. So I couldn't be more grateful to source books for seeing the vision and understanding the gap that we're filling and um, supporting me in my mission to help parents connect with their children and help them to learn communication. This is what I um, hope will be a tool for parents to use when I'm not there and um, build their own confidence in their ability to help their children learn. So this is the first book. It was out um, June 7th. And the second title, which you saw a couple images of, is the My First Learn to Talk book, Things That Go. So um, I'm equally as excited to have a book out there for all of our vehicle loving kids, which really is almost all of them, right? And um, for parents to have and caregivers to have the opportunity to model some of those other fun sounds that children use um, in their play. So thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this. Thank you for listening. And um, I hope that you'll consider including this book um, on your shelves and share it with parents and families who are um, working to help their children learn to communicate. Thank you so much, Stephanie. All right, I am going to move on to the world of Chris Ferry. Um, Chris Ferry has delighted children and families around the world with his unique take on science for the past five years. His baby university board books and picture books have captured the hearts of millions. I mean, millions, literally millions. Chris is the number one science author for kids. We have two new board books coming up on the ABCs of geography and Pythagorean theorem for babies. But now it's time for beginning readers to learn this information for themselves. From general relativity to quantum physics, from astrophysics to rocket science, and from robotics to climate change, the brainy science level one readers, do you know quantum physics and do you know rocket science, will intrigue and teach young scientists a variety of subjects with simple, easy to read text. Looking forward to those books. Okay, did you ever raise a painted lady butterfly? at home maybe, or in school, you know, been out there in the leaves, picking up the caterpillars, well, you're not alone. This stunning insect has wowed kindergarten and first grade classes for generations for its beauty and scientific intricacies. Join a class field trip to a butterfly sanctuary in The Story of a Butterfly for a study on this popular butterfly, encouraging children towards curiosity and exploration and ending with a call to make the earth more accessible for everyone from humans to the tiniest bug. Learn all about the habitat and life cycle of the painted lady from egg to chrysalis to butterfly. Really does seem to be a little bit of magic involved in this metamorphosis. Have you ever wished you could cast a real spell with the wave of a magic wand? Have you ever wanted to mix a real color changing potion? Now kids can perform 30 magical feats with a few simple ingredients and a little help from science. Written by biochemist Kara Florence, the science spell book is the perfect way to engage kids while teaching them about science. Each experiment includes simple instructions, diagrams to follow along with, and an explanation of the science behind each magical experiment. Ready to conjure elixir of enlightenment or fluorescent feast? Or maybe you would like to build your very own wand. What will it be? Stonewall Ambassador, best-selling trans author and former teacher Juno Dawson, the author of this book, is gay, could not join us in person today, but she recorded a brief message for us about what's the tea. Hi everyone, my name is Juno Dawson and I am the author of the brand new What's the Tea from Sourcebooks Fire. Um, I'm so sorry I'm not with you live. I'm currently on my UK book tour going all around the country and we just couldn't make it work on this occasion. Um, I wanna thank you for everything that you're doing, for making sure that my book finds the people who need it. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that right now in both the UK and the US, it's an incredibly stressful time for trans youth. There is a deeply unpleasant debate a conversation going on about basically our right to exist, our access to healthcare, um, our ability to just live our lives in public. 
you know, and I'm in my 40s, so I can only imagine how horrific this time must be for trans youth across America. And what we need to remember at the heart of this conversation, it's just people, just young people who are trying to exist as best they can in the way that makes them feel as comfortable as possible in their own skin. With What's the Tea, it's myself and a bunch of other trans and non-binary people offering some very gentle tips and guidance to young trans and non-binary people. Um, I think it's really important that um, young trans people have got sort of role models and a future to look towards so that they can see a place for themselves in this world. It's also a really challenging time in America for censorship, with librarians, schools, teachers being constantly challenged traffic, constantly being challenged about the books they're providing for young people, especially young LGBTQ people. So as an author and as a publisher, we need your support more than ever. So thank you so, so much for all the love that you're showing to What's the Tea. Um, and let's, let's really help it to find its way into the hands of those young people who are probably kind of anxious right now. And I think this book might help them just feel a little bit calmer. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I'm so far away, you know, I can't be there to promote this book. Um, so everything that you're doing stateside makes such a big difference to me. So from the bottom of my heart, a huge thank you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. All righty. Source Books purchased Blue Wood Books last summer. We have updated six of the most popular 100 titles, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, American women, baseball legends, and science. And now we have a completely new title, 100 Disasters, which will be available in fall 2022. Learn about the fascinating lives and tremendous impact of 100 extraordinary people in these fact-packed biography collection for kids. Simple, easy to read text, illustrated portraits of each figure, fascinating facts about famous and lesser known heroes, and a timeline and trivia question shine light on artists, activists, icons, and legends throughout history. Organized chronologically, each book offers a look at the prominent role these men and women played and how their talents, ideas, and expertise have influenced the country from its very beginning all the way through the present day. 100 Disasters details events such as the Great Fire of London and includes all kinds of information up through the Challenger. And now moving on to our adult list, I'd like to introduce Sarah Horowitz. Sarah has a PhD in modern European history from UC Berkeley and is core faculty in women's gender and sexuality studies at Washington and Lee University. Please tell us about The Red Widow, which we'll be releasing in September. Hi, so I am so honored to be speaking to librarians today. Um, I teach history and I write history, which means that I cannot do anything without the work of librarians. Um, and that this is, um, I hope that will become clear as I sort of talk a little bit about the research process. But I came to this topic about 10 years ago when I was in Paris on a research trip and I was on a tour of Père Lachaise Cemetery with some friends. And as we passed by the tomb of Félix Faure, the man who is president of France um, in the 1890s, our tour guide couldn't resist telling us the story of how Faure had died um, and that he had had a stroke when he was in the arms, so to speak, of his mistress. And then our tour guide had to tell us that about 10 years later, uh, the mistress's husband and mother were found murdered in their home um, and he kind of strongly intimated that uh, the mistress might have had something to do with it. And to be honest, I had trouble believing this. Um, this seemed much too improbable to be true. This seemed like an urban legend that the French like to tell about their politicians. But, you know, I'm, uh, you know, have been well trained to do my research like y'all. Um, and so I went into my library and I started reading the books about um, this woman whose name was Marguerite or Meg Steinau. And I learned that actually the tour guide had been telling the truth and that um, the story that had been written about her life was really wilder than he um, had let on. And then once I got into the archives in Paris, I just realized no one knew the full story. 
that it was absolutely bananas um, and that this was really a case of truth being stranger than fiction. Um, so just to give you some stuff like, you know, Meg, she was a femme fatale who left a trail of death and destruction in her wake. She broke every rule in the book. Um, she'd lied, she blackmailed, she might have poisoned her friend, I don't know. Um, she definitely framed innocent individuals for murder. And what I think is really fascinating is she got away with it. Um, and so I'm really excited that this book is coming out now because when I think when I started it, there sort of wasn't a media echo sphere that in any way resonated with um, the, what I'm said and talked about in the book. Um, but, you know, basically, I feel like everything I've watched on Netflix in the past year or so has reminded me of my book. And that's not just because it's my book and everything reminds me of my book. Um, but I often think of the book as a little bit like Bridgerton, but with murder, where everyone is terrible, no one gets a happy ending. Um, and But similarly, it's a kind of steamy tale of high society. It's also, this is, book is a work of true crime, um, but I think it speaks to a growing unease about the genre of true crime, um, as more of us understand how the authorities can work to protect the rich and put um, the poor and vulnerable in danger. And that really sort of is essential to the narrative of my book. Um, and then, you know, we're kind of in this era of the, the like girl boss gone bad, um, like sort of Anna Delvey or Elizabeth Holmes as these figures. Um, and like them, Meg was really ambitious, really energetic. She had tons of hustle. She's really smart, um, but she didn't quite use her talents for the best purposes. And could not stop lying. So to give you just a taste of her story, before she was unleashing havoc on French society, she was a bored housewife in her early 20s in 1890s Paris. She's married to a mediocre artist, almost twice her age, that she doesn't love. Um, and she's facing the prospect of essentially years, if not decades, of domestic drudgery while her husband pursues affairs with both men and women. You know, Meg was not content with this life. I think a lot of us could maybe understand some of the reasons why. Um, and so she decided to alleviate her loneliness, um, alleviate the financial strain in the household, and also enter high society through affairs with prominent men. And her list of rubber, um, lovers was like a roster of an international who's who. Judges, powerful officials, politicians, industrialists, maybe even a member of a royal family or two. Um, and her most famous conquest was actually Félix Faure, who's the president who um, was buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery. He did actually die of a stroke during one of their um, assignations after a sort of um, affair of about two years that gives her an enormous amount of political power and prestige. And then nine years after he dies, she re-enters the spotlight in a very dramatic fashion. Um, her husband and mother are found murdered in their house, uh, dead of apparent strangulation. And Meg is the sole survivor of the attack and the only witness, but the details of her account and the crime scene just don't add up. And the question becomes how far she'd go to clear her name and how far the authorities would go to protect a member of the elite. And I don't wanna give away too many spoilers, but the answer to both questions is really, really far. Um, so this is a story that takes place over a hundred years ago, but it has a lot of contemporary resonances. It's a story about sex, power, scandal, rumor, elites behaving badly, grifters, conspiracy theories, a criminal justice system that was invested in protecting the rich and punishing the poor. Um, but above all, I think it's really fun because it's a story of an anti-heroine who's both a victim and a villain who often does terrible things. Um, she's a force of absolute chaos, but she is never ever boring. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you recommend it to um, readers who are looking for something kind of like dishy and um you know like who maybe like true crime who like some historical drama um but who wants something that's very very true thank you sarah i'm a history major i think we should all unite <laughs>
this is a wonderful book. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's really, it's just got everything. So I um, want to introduce you to a couple of other autobiographies and biographies. In Tour de Force, Mark Cavendish relates how he thought he was finished. After illness, setbacks, and clinical depression, the once fastest cyclist in the world had been written off by most. At the age of 36, even he believed his explosive cycling career would fade out with a whimper. The Manx man hadn't won a single Grand Tour stage in Italy, Spain, or France since 2016. But then came his incredible resurrection at the 2021 Tour de France, included on the Duenic Quick Step team at the very last minute, Mark set about rewriting history. He claimed back the green jersey he first wore in 2011, and his four stage victories finally saw him matching Belgian legend Eddie Merck's all time record of 34 Tour de France stage wins. Cycling greats are never content, and Cavendish Dodge's determination and inner strength had earned him the record that few believed he could ever achieve. This is his own intimate account of that race right from the saddle of the Miracle Tour. Helltown is a fascinating true crime narrative investigating serial killer Tony Costa, whose killings of young women on Cape Cod captivated literary icons and rivals, Kurt Vonnegut and Norman Mailer, as it unfolded. In the winter of 1969, the bodies of four murdered young women were discovered in a cemetery near the tip of Cape Cod in a place once known as Helltown. A bizarre former taxidermist with a split personality and penchant for violence, Costa ultimately mobilized friends in the hippie community for support and retribution, much like Charles Manson would do months later on the opposite coast. Costa embarked on a daring cat and mouse game with investigators who, as the body count kept growing, were desperate to put an end to the killing season on Cape Cod. Okay, stick with me for this next one. I got a lot of puns. It's really cute. I know we have a lot of dog lovers on this call, and how cute are these labs? Join two of the internet's favorite dogs and their owner, sports broadcaster Andrew Cotter, as he shares journal entries from life during the pandemic. We will find out what really happened after his lockdown superstore labs. Olive and Mabel chewed up the internet and found it was quite tasty. Andrew takes a supply of hilarious walks through the strangest of days, reflecting on how precious our time really is. Endlessly optimistic and eternally hungry dogs by his side. Olive, Mabel, and Andrew have padded around the globe and from obscurity to excited whispers of, is that really Olive and Mabel? Wherever they go. Through it all, Olive and Mabel have always done exactly what they do best, being themselves and being there for Andrew. And for all of us who have loved watching their beautiful videos and following their progress online. If you're a fan of Olive, Mabel, and Andrew, this funny, touching, and extraordinary account of a year like no other is an unmissable treat. And from the UK, let's welcome Richard Mainwaring. Richard is a performing musician composer, TV presenter, and educator. He has composed music for Netflix, the BBC, and the International Space Station. He is classically trained, multi-instrumental, and has worked with artists as diverse as Hugh Laurie, Larry Adler, Eartha Kitt, Haley Westerna, and Tom O'Dell. He also presented over 50 short films for the BBC. Richard is joining us from Holiday in the UK, and over to you. Hello, thank you so much to Sourcebooks. I'm, I'm truly honored uh, to be speaking to you today. Um, I'm from a uh, quite a, a poor uh, working class area of um, South Wales, dominated by industry and mining and all of that. But one of the things we've always had is a passion for education. So libraries, I want to say something about libraries first, but not what you're expecting. Um, I want to say something about libraries. I, I discovered libraries when I was uh, quite late, when I was about 11 or 12. Um, but the thing that is so special about a library, because I'm a musician, so sound is very important to me. The thing about a library is the sound of a library. Don't ever lose that sound of a library, which is very often silence, but not, not an absence of noise, but a, but a, a, a curated, a deliberately curated um, environment in which one can find oneself, one can get into a book and, and, and just lose oneself. So I just want to say a fantastic 
um, a kind of fantastic thank you so much for libraries for their environment, for their oral environment, like a, like a like an oral uh, comfort blanket. They've always felt like that to me. So thank you so much for that. The Welsh word, just in case you're wondering, the Welsh word, you're probably not, for libraries is llyfrgell. Llyfrgell. Enjoy that. Anyway, the, um, the book. Here it is. Look, I've, I've managed to print off even them on holiday. You can't see that there. What they hear is and doesn't. I'm a musician. I'm not a scientist. And I don't expect my readers to be scientists either. Um, this has, I know it sounds like a, a real cliche, but this has been a journey of discovery because I was teaching um, in a studio kind of, you know, technology, uh, music technology in a studio to, to students. And we were trying to talk about frequency, you know, the difference between high frequency and low frequency and all of that in between. And I suddenly thought, how can I explain this better? What kind of analogy can I use? And I came up with this idea of an infinite piano. And I think we've got the slide there somewhere of an infinite piano. And the idea is what, because a piano it has a hair, you know, our, our hearing range kind of sits in a piano, but actually goes a lot further along a piano than we think, especially the high end. Um, so I started thinking, well, frequencies, which I'll explain in a minute, frequency, frequencies go on be beyond the end of a piano. So how far along a piano would I have to go before I could hear the sound of a rainbow? Because <laughs> light is just a set of frequencies. And how far the other way before I could hear the sound of, well, how far down the piano before I could hear the sound of a tsunami or possibly even um, a black hole, which NASA discovered this. Obviously, you can't hear a black hole, but but. And we, I might ch chat to you about that in a minute. Let me explain very quickly frequency. Frequency is basically if I go boo, the air in front of me goes like that. And how much it wobbles back and forth, the speed it wobbles back and forth, uh, basically says if it wobbles back and forth very fast, that's a high frequency. Uh, and if it wobbles very slowly, that's a low frequency. Good. So that's, that's basically the premise behind uh, the book, is this infinite piano. We start down in infrasound, which we can't hear but sometimes we can feel, but it goes so far down. Uh, so down there, there are some really wacky and weird things which I'll mention in a minute. And then it works our way up through our hearing range. And I talk through all of the different stories. Uh, we don't get into great detail because I want people to dip in and dip back out again. And then we go on the other way, up into rainbows, uh, into radiation, and eventually up into the frequencies of time itself. Um, the first story I discovered, though, which you'll find in the book, is, is um, a story about a whale which was singing at 52 hertz. So scientists dropped microphones in the ocean. They were looking for Soviet submarines at the time. Um, and they suddenly heard all of this beautiful sound of the ocean. And one of the things they came across was this whale, which was singing at the wrong frequency compared to um, all, all, all the other whales. I mean, bless it. This thing's going around going... Well, it's not actually it's 52 hertz, which which is a very low frequency. And that's one of the things is 52 hertz means nothing to it. doesn't mean it didn't mean anything to me. It doesn't mean anything to most people. But 52 hertz is dum, dum, da, dum, 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 dum. You know that da, da, dum, dum, another one bites the dust. Well, the beginning of that uh, is around about 50 hertz. And this is what I talk about in the book is I try and link up not just this number, but I try and link up something we know in our kind of oral memory that we can go, oh, that frequency is tied to this or that frequency is uh, tied to that. So um, as I say in, 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 the, in, in the dedication to, to my two young kids that from the beginning, always find fascination in the world. And, that, and that's, that's what this book is there for. It's, it's, and I love what source books have, uh, have done. Erin McClary, fantastic. It's become very bite-sized chunks. I've got lots of diagrams. I think we've got another diagram uh, which explains, hopefully, um, that, that there we go. I don't know where you can see all of that. That's that's um, a black hole and how the, <laughs> the sound, it's not sounds of frequency, which has a period of um, 50, million, uh, 50 million years it takes for the, for the, um, the wave to, to, to work its way along. And it was discovered by the Chandra X telescope. Uh, I'm saying this as if I knew all this before I started. And I'm a musician and I had to learn all of this, but that's, that's what I I've loved it. And I wanted to share that with everyone. Um, I, so, so 
I, I, I always find the fascination on the world, in the world. So it's a kind of come with me on a voyage uh, of discovery. I, I'll, I leave you with a few uh, facts and interesting stories uh, in the book. I mean, it is it is just full of, wow, well, I never knew that. I never knew this. Um, so cats, uh, Margaret, your cat was there earlier. Cats purr at 50 hertz, just around that whale, just around another one bites at dust. Apparently, they, they, and I checked this in my studio, I got my cat to come in and it goes <laughs> at around about 50 hertz. And apparently it's to help them heal their, their bones and their tissue. Um, so it's a healing uh, and, and a kind of health thing that they do, but it's 50 hertz. Um, th there's bits in there about Isaac Newton. You know, we think seven colors of the rainbow. Well, actually, Newton started with five, and then he didn't like the fact it didn't tie in with music. So he added uh, a couple more. Why not? Let's add a few more colors to the rainbow. Uh, rat's whiskers are tuned. Do you know that? Rat's whiskers are tuned like um, like individual strings on a harp. Bananas are radioactive, so they, they vibrate. <laughs> and, and as I said, time itself is measured through frequency through vibration uh, i've got it here because there's no chance of me remembering this 429 trillion hertz that's a strontium atom so now you know that if you want to measure time very accurately you just need to find some strontium atoms and then kind of make them vibrate and they go at um 429 a trillion times <laughs> per second so Thank you. I, I'm honestly, I'm so made up about about being able to to share this 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 book with you. I should show it again, shouldn't I? Oh, it's the wrong way. Well, there we go. What the air has and doesn't. Um, uh, thank you so much to all of you for listening. Thank you to Sourcebooks. I've just been honestly inspirational, taking this idea and have just just made it into something which is which is more than I could have ever uh, wanted. So so and, and thank you to all of you who have such passion for for books so so thank you very much and and enjoy it thank you so much richard i will say that i do not think i have ever detected another one bites the dust from my feisty feline but i will be paying closer attention as we go try forward. it <laughs> try it <laughs> i did hear that they always purred to heal themselves so that makes a lot of sense to me so at any rate all right uh we are going to talk business and self-help as we um round up towards the hour um even when your job can be done from anywhere the place you call home still matters a lot by the old rules of work your dream career determines where you live if you want to make movies move to LA. If you're launching a startup, you'll only succeed in Silicon Valley. But with the meteoric rise of remote and freelance work, more people than ever are becoming location independent. Living in the right place can still make all the difference for your success and happiness. So if work won't dictate where you live, how will you ever decide? If you could live anywhere answers that question. Melody Warnick unpacks the big picture concerns that we often miss when we're writing pros and cons lists about potential destinations. Decision time is our next title. We have to make choices every day big and small, but it's the life-changing ones that often cause us to freeze or react too quickly without thinking. With tips, studies, interviews, and observations, this book will help identify and fight off the common enemies of good decision-making, inertia, procrastination, indecision, and empower the reader to make the choices that matter the most. Lawrence Allison and Neil Shortland have spent over 20 years helping soldiers, police officers, doctors, and other professionals in high-stakes environments make tough decisions when lives are on the line. For readers of Malcolm Gladwell, Decision Time is an inspirational, problem-solving, and decision-making book to identify and empower the reader to make the choices that matter the most using growth mindset. Forgive your damn self. Because feedback isn't just about accepting your flaws, your inadequacies, the things you hide. It's understanding where they come from and rewriting how you see yourself so you can live your goals. Forgive Your Damn Self will help combat imposter syndrome, stop chasing perfection, and embrace your talents, flaws and all. After all, the feedback we give ourselves has a direct impact on how we speak to ourselves, believe in ourselves, and treat both ourselves and those around us. So if anybody wants to complain about my reading today, I will take that self-criticism very well. Daily Creative. 
from the best-selling author of The Accidental Creative and Die Empty comes an inspirational guide that helps professionals spark creativity day in and day out. Avoid burnout and inspire creativity with this daily reader that pushes the reader to feel energized and ready for innovation. Each reading is designed to improve focus and achieve their goals and takes five minutes to complete. You would probably be surprised by how many creative tools you use every day. You solve problems, design, write, invent, or in other words, create. Does racial discrimination harm Black children's sense of self? The doll test illuminated its devastating toll. Dr. Kenneth Clark visited rundown and under-resourced segregated schools across America, presenting Black children with two dolls, a white one with hair painted yellow and a brown one with hair painted black. Give me the doll you'd like to play with, he said. Give me the doll that is a nice doll. The psychological experiment Kenneth developed with his wife, Mamie, designed to measure how segregation affected Black children's perception of themselves and other Black people was enlightening and horrifying. Over and over again, the young children, some not yet five years old, selected the white doll as preferable and the brown doll as bad. Some children even denied their race. What the children told us is the story of the towering intellectual and emotional partnership between two black scholars who highlighted the psychological effects of racial segregation. The Clark story is one of courage, love, and an unfailing belief that black children deserve better than what society was prepared to give them. Next up is make space for happiness. Do you feel like you have too much stuff? Boy, am I glad the camera is facing this way and not that way. A cluttered space isn't just inconvenient. The truth is it's hard to lead a joyful, purposeful life when the things around you detract from your relationships, habits, and goals. But decluttering is more than getting rid of the stuff you already have. To make real change in your home, you need to look at how these excess possessions got there in the first place. This book examines the acquisition cycles that keep our homes overcrowded and distract us from going after the meaningful things we really want in our lives. And now our last speaker is Erica Bolstad, a journalist and documentary filmmaker in Portland, Oregon. Her work on climate change has appeared in the Washington Post, Scientific American, and many other publications. And she's here to talk a little bit about family history. Over to you, Erica. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here today and to, uh, to share a little bit about Windfall with you. I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon, where I'm a freelance journalist and where I'm also making a, um, a short film about Windfall and about some of the themes in Windfall. So I was just in North Dakota, which is the main setting for Windfall um, a couple of weeks ago getting a little bit more footage, a little bit more background uh, for the film. I keep going back over and <laughs> over again, as you will see in the book, that's kind of a theme. Um, I'm so glad to be talking to librarians. Um, as with many, as with many of the nonfiction authors who've been on here today, I'm deeply in your debt. Um, I have a special shout out for the librarians at the University of Oregon who got me tons of interlibrary loans uh, from North Dakota, some uh, oral histories and um, firsthand accounts of one of the very first oil booms in North Dakota. Uh, that is uh, deeply woven into my book and um, to the Petworth branch of the Washington DC library where I used to live. Um, I wrote uh, a couple of early drafts of a few chapters, I think chapters nine and 10, very distinctly remember working on those um, in the uh, one of the main rooms of the Petworth uh, library. And, uh, and of course, to the Multnomah County Library uh, here in Portland, Oregon, and uh, the librarians in, um, in Portland were great uh, during the height of the pandemic about getting some magazines, some old magazines from the 1950s for me out of the basement um, that were, um, that helped shed some light on why oil tycoons were such a subject of fascination in uh, the 1950s. So thank you very much. Um, I'm really excited to tell you a little bit more about Windfall. Um, this book is about what happened when I went in search for answers about uh, why my mother inherited some mineral rights in 2009 in North Dakota at the height of the oil boom. We had very few connections to North Dakota um, at the time and it had been a long time since anyone in my family had lived there. Um, and this kind of came out of the blue. 
um, at the time, I was working as a journalist in Washington, D.C., covering environmental issues and climate change for McClatchy newspapers. And so I knew, uh, you know, a little, maybe a little bit more about climate change and fracking than like the average person, but I, I didn't know that much. Um, and um, I really wanted to go to North Dakota and find out more. I wanted to find out more about the, the the story of the oil boom itself, but also my family's history and why we inherited these mineral rights. And I wanted to dig into the woman at the very heart of Windfall, which is my great grandmother, Anna, who um, was the, the woman who homesteaded the land in the early 1900s and in Northwestern North Dakota, and who um, who these mineral rights were over the years that, that who we essentially inherited them from. And I wanted to know more about her. I'd only heard sort of the family stories about her and not a lot. And a lot of them were sort of mythical and maybe not that truthful. Um, and, um, and so I wanted to find out more. And, um, and so I did, I set out for North Dakota. I went there first in 2013 and uh, my very first trip there, I was able to, or maybe it was my second trip. I was able to get um, some records from the mental hospital where um, Anna had been um, confined uh, by her husband and, um, and uh, lived most of her uh, adult life in that mental hospital, not giving any way, way any spoilers on that. It's on the book jacket. So, um, but sh um, so I went and uh, uncovered the story of, of uh, why she was there. I found the records right before, actually before they were destroyed, which was, which was very lucky. I quit my job to work on this project and worked on it for a while and life things happened, went back to uh, a couple of journalism jobs, moved across the country, et cetera. Um, but over the years, kept going back uh, to North Dakota to do more research uh, and um, just kept being drawn, I think, as I describe it in the book, by these whispers, um, this, 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 this idea, this American sort of whisper of we could be rich. And that is sort of the, the, the thing that I think was kind of blowing over the plains for my great-grandmother, for many other people who took advantage of the Homestead Act uh, in, in uh, America. And, um, and in some ways, I think it was calling to me, too. Um, I just this week am working on answering some of the, the questions for readers at the back of, um, of the book. And um, and one of them that I that I absolutely love that came from my editor is um, is I think I'll share it with you because I think it, it just reflects one of the major themes of the book, which is reckoning with the myths of the West and 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 also um, the greed kind of at the heart of that whisper we could be rich. And um, it is how did I how did I reconcile my knowledge as someone who cares deeply about climate change and who writes about environmental issues. How did I reconcile my knowledge of, of fracking and its negative con consequences with, you know, the, those whispers that were calling to me, um, the desire for, um, you know, I, I really, in some ways was rooting for, um, for uh, oil companies to drill on Anna's land. Um, and how did I, how did I reconcile that? And, and I, I think that that's, um, that is what readers will kind of see over the course of of this book is really grappling with that question of of how we can hold these two things uh, in our in our hearts and minds at once, wanting the best for our families, but also wanting um, you know caring deeply about um, our connections to the earth and to uh, climate change and and how individually we might be impacting some of those decisions. So. Um, I do want to just kind of talk a little bit about maybe what kind of readers would be interested in this book. I, I hope that it's a general audience. Um, I am kind of an old school newspaper reporter in some ways. I've been a journalist my whole career and um, and I write for general audiences. And I thought about that a lot while um, thinking about how to put together this book, how narratively it should work. And so the chapters are, you know, they're relatively short. They kind of have cliffhangers at the end. Um, and it's structured in sort of a three act structure that is very, probably will be very familiar to anyone who's seen a movie. Um, and I worked very hard at creating that structure so that it was an accessible book for readers who may not 
realize that they're getting a book about you know that really delves into some um, issues around climate change, uh, they may not necessarily realize that they've got the story of Anna and um, and the the mental hospital there uh, to kind of carry them through uh, the midsection of the book and um, and so I, I was very deliberate about how I structured the book because I wanted it to be as accessible to as many people uh, as possible. So I think that's about all I've got for today. I'm so grateful that uh, you gave me the time to talk about Windfall. And obviously, if you have any questions about it, you can reach out to Sourcebooks. And, um, and I'd, I'd love, to, love to see it on the shelves of your libraries. Thanks so much, Erica. Um, I hope that you all enjoyed hearing from our authors today. Um, we certainly appreciate having you join us for part of the afternoon. A reminder to take advantage of the non-fiction uh, promotion that's going on with Overdrive now. And um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Have a great night. Take care.